Okay, we're live. Cool. All right, so uh, we're ready to go. So I'd like to say welcome to the presentation on the Blackboard Web Conference in Portland, for e portal. My name is Tim Bertine. I am an employee and an alumni of UW Madison. Uh, I think this presentation is probably only going to last about 25 minutes. Can I have a demo and then uh, some type of questions at the end? So who am I? As I said earlier, I'm Tim Bertine. Uh, I grew up in Wisconsin in a little town called Baraboo, the circus city, if anyone has ever heard of that. Um, I went to school at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, graduated in 2011. After time in the telecommunications industry, I came back home, and for the last nine months, worked in the same computer science building that I spent many sleepless nights in. Earlier this year, I became a portal committer. Oh, very excited for that. So my role in the Blackboard portal isn't necessarily huge. Uh, but I am the lead committer of the project here at the conference. The three uh, people that edge me out are current or past UW employees, Tim Lovett, Eric Dahlquist, and Brad Beach. But I'm getting up there too. So I wanted to give a brief outline of what I'm going to be talking about today. This presentation is really going to focus on some really interesting technologies that we're using in the Blackboard web conferencing portal. After talking about these, we'll be able to see a demonstration of the Portland. Um, during this presentation, there are going to be code snippets. I've added the code file locations to the slides. Um, and of course, the entire repo is open for anyone who wants to look at it. This presentation is a Google Doc that's linked via Lanyard, and the code location also linked via Lanyard. So uh, feel free to take a look at the presentation and ship you know, any questions come up. Um, very useful seeing examples. Um, of what's actually working. So, what is the Blackboard Web Conferencing Portlet? This Blackboard Portlet is an interface for the Blackboard Web Conferencing Service. It requires that an institution have an agreement with Blackboard. So, the UW Madison, we pay Blackboard a certain amount of money, and we have access to their service, and we get support for it. This portlet allows users to create and edit sessions and manage participants. Users can also access their past sessions and session recordings. They also have the ability to override the default telephony and set their own. Um, first time I heard the word telephony, I didn't actually know what it means. <laughs> so it's where you put in a number or a website and people know where to go to access and communicate with everyone. Um, the Web Canvassing Portlet has proven to be one of our most used portlets, um, very popular with faculty and staff especially. UW Madison also operates a portal for the UW system. The UW system is a collection of 13 four-year universities and 13 two-year colleges. And this is one of the few portlets we've deployed on the system side. Communication across the system has proven to be very crucial, and the portal is very happy to provide the service. And the faculty and staff are very happy to have this with them. So here's some technologies I'm going to cover. Um, they're all pretty cool. Uh, the five I'm going to cover are Spring Forms, Spring Security, Data Tables, Session Storage, and of course the web services that are used to communicate with Blackboard. Spring Forms. Let's talk about Spring Forms first. Spring Forms are great for user inputs that you want to tie to a Java object. In web design and Portland design, there are many times where the user is on the front end merely filling out the exact fields of an object. And you take their inputs, map them one by one the fields of an object. This is a little tiresome and tedious. Spring Informs allows us to bypass some of those middle steps. There are some parts of the Spring Form that are important. There's a Java model that you want to use, and on the front end, you actually need to use the Spring Form. Let's go take a look at the Java side. In the Blackboard portlet, we're going to want to model the session form object, for example. So, as you can see, I've put a link to where uh, the code can be found, and I put a little code snippet. So this is really a session that we need to model in the back end, um, but the user also inputs their session information. Um, so now that we have a session model, it's got a session ID, got a start time and end time, and a couple other fields that I haven't shown. Let's go see how it looks in the front end. On the front end, Here's the form to edit an existing session. 
the interesting part to see is the spring nested path tag. So we've added the session form to path. You can see that we hide elements and automatically add them. For example, the user doesn't need to modify their own session ID. So we simply don't show that to the user while still adding the information to the object. We can also have user inputted values. Here, we're using a data picker to select the start time of the session. Anything that we can do with a normal form, we can do here. Because of this form, we're able to skip a transformation step that we would have to do in a controller. So let's go take a look at the controller. Here's a brief code snippet from the session edit controller. As part of the model that's returned, we already have a session form object. This is a pretty basic example of how to check if the model contains a session form and how to edit the attribute if necessary. Spring security. So spring security allows us to restrict certain functionality to the user based on the roles. Uh, we define a validating function, then we apply the function to methods. This allows us to check for proper authorization and recall certain things. We can also check for authorization on the front end, which is uh, pretty exciting and useful. The Blackboard web context import that uses this feature because session owners have different functionality than session participants. For example, if you are a session owner, you can add or remove participants, but if you're a participant, you probably shouldn't be going in and adding session start times. That would just mess with everyone. So let's go take a look at how we can define a validating function. Here in the security context XML, uh, this is the same file that we were at your Will's tenancy uh, talk. He added in things as part of this file. We define what we want for a validator. In this case, we have a class with methods that determine this. Um, feel free to take a look at the role hierarchy info class for more details. For other implementations, you can also use a text file with usernames, or you can validate people via a database. Um, Spring security is pretty um, flexible that way. Having a defined validating theme allows us to define different validators. So in this example, we have one validator, but you're allowed to have some of these you want. Um, that way, we can have different ways of validating different people. Um, here, we're defining what it means to be have the role admin. Security, Spring security annotations. Um, so here we have a get session shares method. This method gives participants a session. This is something that only the admins in the session should be able to see. So we can call this method and filter out and return results only based on what they have access to see. So we pre-authorize has role role admin. Um, taking from the comment there, a user needs to edit the view to set a session shares, but we don't want the call to fail. So what this means is, so unless you're an admin, this call isn't going to be made. Uh, this means we want to do a check in the code to, um, before we do the call to the web service. The code here is from the session service people class. Now, what are we going to do on the front end? We're going to have two JS keys for a session admin or a session participant. No. Um, so using include.jsp, we can bring in the Spring Frameworks tags. Um, in this example, we're using SEC as a prefix. So Spring is a security tag that only allows us to show certain parts of the front end page to authorized users. Using the same validating function from before, here is the view section of JSP. So we don't want to show the links to moderators unless we're our moderator for the session. And this allows us to have only one JSP instead of two JSP roles. So, uh, a lot of the editor links, uh, obviously the view moderator links, we can keep those from unauthorized users. Uh, third technology I'm going to talk about is data tables. Um, data tables is a front end presentation for HTML tables. Um, from data tables.net, here's how they describe themselves Data tables is a plugin for the jQuery JavaScript library. It's a highly flexible tool based upon the foundations of progressive enhancement and will advance the interaction controls of any HTML table. So that's pretty cool. Um, currently, this is a resource server, which makes it pretty great and easy to use in any portal. Um, it's a great way to show users' content in the list. Um, and in a couple slides, I'm going to give you some examples. Um, it includes pagination to tailor to specific users. 
Um, it's got a search mechanism built in. We can hide columns from views while still making those columns searchable. Um, hidden columns are useful for things like keywords and descriptors that you still want to search over. Data Camels also integrates really well with Bootstrap, which makes this really great for responder. So how do you add data tables? So to use data tables, you have to include the JS file from the resource server. It's also available via CDN. Um, then all you do is do a little JavaScript call when you feed in some parameters. In this example, we're calling the data table function on a table. And by default, you don't have to give any options. The work is going to give a few. Uh, when the JavaScript function is called, the HTML code is generated and rejected. So this adds classes, styling, and other JavaScript functions used. A little bit of a markup. So when the JS is hit on the page render, classes are add added, and the markup is checked right away. Um, the classes that are added are listed on datatables.net, or what you can do is you can run the JavaScript on your page. Just look at the table right there. Um, seeing the classes is really easy to apply your own CSS styling to the page. Um, and you can include the CSS even before the HTML is created. In this screenshot, uh, we're showing how you can easily add color to the list to meet your school needs. Um, here we've given our gold and white look. Um, you can see that there's multiple sort of columns. Um, which columns are sortable and which columns are not sortable is a variable that you can set. This uh, example also shows that we're taking out some of the standard data tables features. Um, you'll see that there is no search. Um, well, that's included for free for lunch. Pagination is gone. Um, you don't see next or previous. So this is pretty customizable to your needs. You can also see how easy it is to differentiate between rows. Yeah, like even rows and odd rows have different styles by default, and we go over in the classes to make links look certain ways and uh, colors in certain ways. Um, I also want to point out that the upcoming sessions and completed sessions are tabs. This is going to be important in a little bit when I talk about session storage in a few slides. Um, I included an example about data tables with Responder, uh, just for an example. So this one shows pagination. Uh, when using Bootstrap, Bootstrap will automatically override the classes. The data tables uses the pagination class that Bootstrap does too. So that's why you can see, for example, the pagination at the bottom looks exactly like Bootstrap's pagination. Um, this is also an interesting example because we've added elements to the data tables. So that feature Portland section, that's a section we added into the add bar markup. And the buttons are added with the markup. So this is highly customizable to what you guys want to use for uh, presenting data tables. Data tables also includes APIs to call functions in the table. So the buttons that we've added, they call certain methods to sort tables or sort columns. Um, with that, you can also hide columns, you can show columns. Um, anything that you can do in the data tables is exposed. Session storage. Okay. So session storage is a new technology that came out from having different tabs within the Blackboard portlet. But switching between the window states, we wanted the user to stay on the same tab. Um, so session storage is an HTML5 standard that allows us to store a small piece of information in the browser itself. There's no need to store the state on the server. Since this is a presentation only, um, it doesn't make sense to store it in a variable on the server. You just have to memory to store it. And the cool thing about this is that it only keeps the variable around for the life of the browser tab. So as soon as you close your tab, the uh, session storage goes away. How do you use it? Uh, using session storage is pretty easy. Here we have a code that shows how to set and get the variable back. Uh, the value loop is named current WCP tab. Also, in this example, it's shown how to namespace the variables using the portal namespace. An important thing to do if you allow multiple portlets to be used on the same page. So for us, we can have different Blackboard portlets on the same page and switching between modes will remember which portlet was in what tab. Um, if your older browser does not support HTML5, kind of looking at Internet Explorer there, it will uh, gracefully 
right, and return null. So this means that if you have a null value, you can just set a default. Um, and then uh, the last technology I want to touch on below is so web services. So obviously, a big part of the Blackboard world is the web service calls themselves. Here, you can see an example of how to make calls. Um, this is the section WSPAO component class. Um, feel free to take a look at the Blackboard code and see how the exact calls are being made. But, um, just a small web service it has around some of those So, before I go on a little bit of a demo, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> so, all right. What kind of things work? Uh, all that matters. So here I wanted to show. Uh, I don't know if we want to just be on a completed sessions tab. Uh, see some sessions. Uh, maybe I want to go to a maximize mode. And I stay on the completed sessions. Why things work there, I don't know. Um, scheduling a web conference session. Um, here's the spring form I was talking about. Um, takes things like name, start time, um, end time, initial settings of all that, combining to your type of object. Let me cancel that. Cancel that, so it's back to the service tab, which of course takes forever to load. <laughs> Want to create a new tab? Yeah, new tab would be great. Um, here you can see the HTML uh, data tables. Uh, you can see that it looks great on a small screen. And of course, it goes larger, large screen. So the editor is bootstrap really well using the table class. Um, so it is responsive and responsive to Portland's. Um, so given that, is there anything else that I can demo or any questions that anyone else has? Mm -hmm. Super yeah. quick question. That foreign colon hidden, does that mean it becomes like you can't put technical hidden, or does that mean it's only user? Yeah, so I'm just gonna repeat the question. Um, on session forms, if we have an input hidden field, what does that really mean? You're correct, it shows up on the HTML page as a hidden input. Um, so there are some security concerns around that. Probably where I'm guessing you're going with that. Um, Which is something that's server side. If it was server side, that would be really neat. But um, no, it's client side, and then we check the yes session ID there. Good question. Allowing the wrong spring form to model binding is a way to, to hurt yourself yeah. badly. Um, you know, don't let end users bind fields that they should be binding or validate their input after they do it. That was a security thing you found with possibly a while ago, right? We've so, all done it. Yeah. We've all done it. But yes, it's very easy to um, let somebody, you know, if you've got some object that's got like an owner field and you are naive about accepting the default generated auto binding, then a nefarious user like me can add a form field client side, set that value to something else, and do horrible things. Um, all the Spring technology 
you know, give you places to nuance what should be bound. You can have your own custom binders. You can catch it on validation, though that's a little wonky. Don't do that. Or um, you can do it declaratively in a Spring Webflow, for instance. So you got options. Yep. Um, that's something that we're probably going to take care of soon. Um, the rest of why it hasn't been done yet is there are so few session uh, moderators that you go and moderate right to somebody else's session. If you go and dig through the HTML, it's good for you, so it's like you did a lot of work. Yeah. How, how hard is it to uh, incorporate Spring Security? Like I saw you had some annotations. Like, is that as easy as it is, or do I have to do a lot more setup for it to uh, work properly? Yeah, so the question is, uh, how easy is it to get Spring Security? Yeah. Um, so I'll be honest. I wasn't going to do this presentation, <laughs> so I had to go do a little spring security tutorial myself. Um, it's not too bad. Okay. Um, here we're doing a validating function, but you can also use a database. Uh, username and passwords can validate very easily. Text file with usernames, so as long as they have a username. Um, it's actually not too bad. All right. um, I've seen a lot of harder to implement technology. So maybe you know, picking it up in the context of a portlet, um, you know what you're going to want to be able to do is is check that things are check that a user's in a given role. So you know you're doing role mapping. That's that's some configuration to do. Um, obviously, there's the the you know, Maven dependency so that you have access to Spring Security. Um, and then you, know, you didn't show the the JSP declaration, but there's a taglib declaration to get yeah, that. Yeah, actually, um, but. Yeah. Um, oh, you do? Oh, great. I thought it was in the include, but what do I know? It was in the include, but I um, oh, there it is. pasted the include stuff, so yeah, yeah it's interesting. If you do a little declaration with your config file, um, you can include the prefix in for JSP, and then you can do pre-authorization, you can do post-authorization on methods. Um, not too bad, so um, in here I've listed the files, so you can take a look at them, some examples. Just a certain amount of following the bouncing ball from the uPortal group to the portlet.xml role to the spring security role to the annotation. Just kinda... Like all spring stuff, there's a little bit of uh, black magic until you find out where it comes to <laughs> it's A little easier to follow the trail that way. Any other questions? All right. Well, like promised, uh, we're going to get on a little early. So, thank you very much. I'll go ahead and stop this then.